Good day, and welcome to Lesson 4 in our study of the book of Thessalonians. Now, if you were with us the last two lessons, then you realize that Thessalonica was a major city in the days of Paul, and was a melting point, melting pot of all sorts of individuals, religions, personalities, uh, countries. And Paul had been there for a short period of time before he was driven out by the established religions and established customs of the area of the day. He had gone from there back to Athens and from there to Cornus, from which he was now writing this letter to the, to the Thessalonians. And Paul, in the first uh, chapter, gave us the reasons of why Thessalon Thessalonica and why the Thessalonian church was so important, why it had developed so much, so fast, in such a way that it was spread not only in Macedonia, but also to Acacia, to the other provinces of Rome. And that they said before that there was not need for them to say or do anything because their, what they had preached had already gone before them. But at the same time, <clears throat> there was some considerable opposition to Paul and Timothy and Silas from the people in Thessalonica. And he was now writing this letter to support the church, to tell them why they should believe him, why his ministry was, it was important and was the truth. And the first part of chapter 2, he says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were have bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Paul is making the point that what they were saying was truthful and it did not come to them, not come to the people of Thessalonica under any perverse means or perverse reasons. He said that they had suffered before and they knew this. The people who were in Thessalonica knew that they had suffered in Philippi. And it says this suffering was reported in Acts 16, verses 23 to 24, where it was mentioned that they had been thrown into jail, where the he and Silas, Paul and Silas, had continued to praise God and to sing hymns and how an earthquake had opened the jail at night, and as a result of this and of the fact that no one had escaped, the jailer and his family also came to Christ. So this was a conflict. They had come to they had come to Thessalonica in much conflict. And they were told Paul says that he was told by God to speak the gospel. So it was not felt that they came there because of vanity or that their coming there was something that was not fruitful or worthwhile. They did not come in vain to them. They had come there for a reason. They had been sent by God, bold in our God, to speak to you the gospel of God, even after much conflict as they had had in their previous uh, experiences in Philippi and other areas. So, they, he said that our exhortation, our belief, our promotion of the gospel did not come because of error, did not come because there was uncleanness in this, in our spirits or in our message. Now, it has to be remembered that at this day and age, there were hundreds of different cults, hundreds of different people going about spreading a gospel, spreading, spreading stories about their own gods, their own myths, their own religions. This was Paul's exhortation, Paul's appeal to the Thessalonians was not the only one that was going about. There were many people spreading rumors, spreading lies, spreading all sorts of different profound and suspected gospels. But Paul says he was, did not come from error or uncleanness. Nor was it in deceit. He was not trying to deceive the people. He was not trying to be, try, not trying to do this and bring any sort of error to them. 
but Paul wanted them to know what he was speaking was the truth. And so he says this, that he, they had come in conflict, but they were made bold in their God to speak what was not, the, not in error, not in, not in deceit, but the truth. And he says, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, now, being entrusted with the gospel was something that was really important and really part of the basis of their, of their message. It says in Titus 1-3 that they were committed to the gospel. It says in 1 Timothy 1 verses 11 and 12 that the glorious gospel was committed to my trust, to the trust of Paul and to Timothy. And it says in Jeremiah, even Jeremiah says, his word was in my heart like a burning fire. And this is what Paul had, Paul felt, that this word had to be given out. It was entrusted to Paul by God, and he was approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. He was saying he was not speaking in a manner that was to be pleasing to men. He was not changing the gospel to make himself more approachable to men or to be more approved by men, but he wanted to be approved by God. Not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Many people went around in those days spreading gospels, as I've already said, spreading different types of religions and different types of messages. And many of this was done as a means to enrich the people spreading the news. So many of these pagan preachers would come in and uh, to an area and really take money from people and take their goods for themselves and then leave. And this is what Paul was trying to say against because they had been accused of this by the people in Thessalonica. But Paul says very clearly, neither in any time did we use flattering words. They weren't trying to flatter people. They weren't trying to make themselves more, more than they actually were. They were not trying to impress people with their words. They didn't use flattering words. They didn't use uh, any type of of this type of speech and it wasn't used as a cloak for them to covet what other people had or what the people of that area really had. They didn't come in attempting to take their, take their goods or their wealth or their money. They said this was not, they did not come in at any time did we use words of flattery as a cloak for covetousness. God is a witness to this. Nor did we ask keep glory from men, neither from you or from others. They didn't do this to make themselves high in the, high in the minds of men. They didn't seek themselves glory for themselves. They didn't seek any kind of real uh, accolades for themselves. They didn't make demands. They didn't make demands as apostles. As apostles, when we, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, so he didn't come seeking wealth, or seeking fame, or seeking some kind of accolade, as they might have, if they came as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Paul is saying that they came to these people as a gentle mother might come to her children. They came to be helpful, to be comforting, to be consoling. They came to help the people, just as a mother helps her children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, the gospel which God had given them, approved in them, but also 
our own lives because their own lives illustrated what they were preaching. In other words, they practiced what they preached. This is really what it's saying. They came gently to the people of Thessalonica, not desiring anything of the, of the, of the people's wealth or belongings. They did not try to cover anything that they had. They came gently. They came as a mother would with her children to do what's best for the people of Thessalonica. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. Paul and Silas, Paul at least, apparently worked at night as a, as a tent maker so he could preach during the day to the people. So he didn't become a burden, he didn't become demanding of them or a burden to them in supporting him. He supported himself while he was there. So he said, our labor, and for you remember our labor and toil, because people knew that he was working as, a, as independently outside of his ministry. He said, for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved yourselves among you who believe. To those people who accepted Paul and who believed in him, he wanted to emphasize how honestly, how much love, how without blame, they had interacted with these people so that they could be an example to those otherwise who had not already accepted Christ. He wanted his life and his actions and his abilities to be an example to those people who believed in him and also to those who do not yet believe that Paul was preaching the truth. You were witnesses, along with God, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly, how honestly they dealt with the people there, how we behaved ourselves among you who believe, how we built you up, how we exhorted you, and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. In the previous part of the, of the chapter, he mentioned about a mother being gentle, coddling her children, being there for them, helping them, supporting them, as a mother, as a mother might uh, cherish her own children. Now he's talking as a father who comforts, who also exhorts, who also charges, who also disciplines, if needed, if you want to use that word, as needed, who comforts and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. He wanted the people to be comforted, he wanted them to be consoled, to felt warm and accepted, but also to be charged that, what they, that they behave honestly before God and that they not misbehave as a father hopefully disciplines his children and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children as a result that they could walk blamelessly before God. In this there are, there are a number of things that, that, that we should notice there are ways in which a minister, how, how one should not do ministerial work, how one should not try to spread the gospel, and it is one should, should not be in vain. One should not be in vanity or should not be in vain. There should be not an error or uncleanness, as it says in the first part of this chapter. Uh, not an error or uncleanness, nor in deceit. Not in deceit, they did not come in error, in deceit, in vanity, in uncleanness. You should not, it's not a good to try to minister in, in trying to be more pleasing to men, or to use flattering words, or to be covet, covetous, and to seek glory for yourself. All these things are ways not to minister, not to spread the gospel, not in vain, 
not in error, not in uncleanliness, not in deceit, not in putting, not in trying to please men, not in seeking glory for one's own self, not using flattering words, and not in a covetous type of way. But one should try to minister by being gentle, by imparting the gospel, imparting their own lives, imparting our own lives, as it says in, this, in, the, in this chapter, preaching the gospel of God, exhorting, comforting, and charging one another. So there are the ways to not spread the gospel in this chapter. There's the ways that one can spread the gospel in this chapter. And it also shows that in order to do this, if you're going to be someone who does this, that you have to be in some ways courageous, the same way Paul and Silas were in Philippi when they were thrown into jail. There has to be some degree of conscientiousness so that you can be committed to the gospel that is in turn committed to you to spread. If you feel that you have been entrusted with a gospel, a true gospel, that you have to have some kind of commitment to do this and being conscientious conscientious, conscientious to do it as well. There has to be some degree of courage involved in this because of the fact that the, the idea is that the flesh always wages war against the spirit. There is the spirit waging war against the flesh and vice versa. There's always a conflict. So in some degrees, you have to be somewhat courageous in order to do this. There has to be a simple and sincere way to promote the gospel. It must be done in a simple manner. There's also, it has to be done, proclaimed convincingly. The gospel, the gospel is not to be accommodated to people. The gospel must be true and must be maintained. It cannot be accommodated to or changed to accommodate people. People really should be changed by it, not the other way around. It must be done with humility. As Acts says in Acts 20, 14, serving the Lord with all humility. Second Corinthians says, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ risen. Therefore, it has to be done with some degree of humility and must be, deep, must be cautiously done, so it is done in the right way. It must be comforting as a mother. It must be as willing to discipline as a father. So all of these are different ways which have come from this first part of chapter 2. There are the ways to minister, the ways not to minister, and the ways in which if you do minister, the acts under which, the ways under which it must be done. So this is what Paul all says in these first Ten verses of the second chapter of, Thess of Thessalonic Thessalonians. As it says in 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved and someone who does not need to be ashamed of the gospel. So, this is the first part of the ministerial part of Paul in the Thessalon Thessalonians. Uh, it is, there's a lot in this if you really take it apart. But it tells you how Paul responded to the problems and to the criticisms in Thessalonica and how he presented himself as a true minister and purveyor of the true gospel. And this is the way in which it was done. These are the points that he made, how he presented himself as an honest purveyor of gospel to the people of Thessalonica, to those who had not believed in the gospel the first time, and also as support to those who had already decided to follow Christ. So we'll get into the rest of this chapter next week, and hopefully you'll be with me for that as well. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.